May 10th. This is day one. We spent all day packing the van, which we were supposed to do yesterday, and took all day today, but we got everything. It looks great. We got everything we need for 107 days on the road. We're gonna get some idea of how LGBT rights are progressing throughout the country and what's happening on a state-to-state -state basis. It's interesting that LGBT people live in every state and yet we have different rights. So you can be in Massachusetts and if you're gay or lesbian, you have the right to marry. But if you drive a few more states, your citizenship status changes. This is the first time I've really heard anybody seriously addressing the differences state to state. Because I read, I read that somebody passed the law in one state and then I think, well, what if they move? I mean, this is ridiculous. Gay people in our country still don't have full equality, and as a gay person and someone who cares about politics and cares about making sure that American citizens get involved in making a difference, um, I think that working for um, GLBT equality is something that drives me very personally. In West Virginia, uh, it's legal for someone to be fired because they're gay. Um, I, I know a friend of mine, he's got a master's degree in education, and he was fired by Ron Severt public schools, Roncevert City School System for being gay. Wow. Yep. And it's completely legal. And it messed his head up. We want to share the stories of LGBT America. I hope that people in the LGBT community will see other folks' stories and be able to relate to them. I hope that the straight community will see these stories and realize that we are real people just living our lives and we want nothing more than fair treatment under the law. People in the community know that gays and lesbians are there. You know, in this community in Lewisburg, you know, uh, the, the straight community knows that we cut their hair, we, we take care of their, their health, uh, we pump their gas, we uh, take care of their flower arrangements, we serve them their dinner, we did their taxes last year, um, and so they know it. But no one talks about it. It's one of those issues, the elephant in the room, that everyone has just said, okay, let's just let, let bygones be bygones and we don't need to talk about it. Hey guys, how you doing? Um, good, my name's Chris. I'm making a documentary about gay rights in Alabama. I was wondering if you'd be willing to talk to us about your feelings about um, gay rights in Alabama. I think that you'll find that Alabama is by and large conservative. Mm -hmm. And it's probably going to be a, an uphill battle in terms of gay rights and, yeah. and pushing through legislation to that effect. If you had asked me that question about five years ago, I would have given you a completely different answer. I would say overall people have more of an opinion of, I don't want to talk about it, instead of, yeah. you know, voicing yes, no. But there are definitely people who are strongly against it, and we are in the Bible Belt. So. Yeah. The violence against homosexuality is a lot more prevalent in southern states, mm -hmm. and, you know, the fear, you know, of coming out yeah. can be a big issue. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Homosexuality is a problem that concerns us all. Ralph was sick. A sickness that was not visible like smallpox, but no less dangerous and contagious, a sickness of the mind. You see, Ralph was a homosexual, a person who demands an intimate relationship with members of their own sex. I mean, I can't think of an instance living in Lubbock where being gay doesn't play a part in my life. I can't, I have to go grocery shopping with earbuds in my ears listening to my iPod because I don't want to walk through the stores listening to people call me a faggot. They glorify unnatural sex acts. They tell youngsters that it sparks, it's thrilling, it provides kicks to be a homosexual, a sadist, and every other kind of deviant. Because it is not something that you choose to be. I mean, if it is a choice, why would you choose to um, be threatened, being beaten up, um, which I have had happen to me where, you know, I've had people threaten to beat me up. And There's a storm gathering. The clouds are dark. 
and the winds are strong. And I am afraid. Some who advocate for same-sex marriage have taken the issue far beyond same-sex couples. They want to bring the issue into my life. My freedom will be taken away. Our nation must defend the sanctity of marriage. You do feel alone a lot. I had to search. It took a long time to search for someone I could really relate to. And I found her. She's awesome. And she's my first partner. And I buried her the day before Valentine's Day this year. Yeah. Yeah. And it's weird the reactions that I get because if it were my sister's boyfriend or if it were a heterosexual partner, I know I would have got someone to care, you know? But no one really said anything to me. No one really knew what to say. The people that did say things said things more like, well, if she really loved you the way she said, that you said that she did, then she's not in a good place right now. You're telling these miserable hell-bound, bathhouse wallowing, anal copulating fags that God loves them? You have bats in the belfry! Topeka! Hopefully this is French Fops and I'll call him back. Oh, please, 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 please. Hello? Hi! Hi, Shirley, how are you? Good. Oh, that's okay, I'm available. Um, are, do you have any time to speak to me on camera today? Um, when's, when is good for you? I guess as soon as possible is, is good for me. Okay. Okay, sounds good. All right, I'll see you there, uh, 2.15. All right, thanks a lot, bye. All right, so that was Shirley Phelps. That is the daughter of Fred Phelps. Um, she's like the main activist now, now that Fred Phelps is, he's really sick and he's old and he's about to pass away. So Shirley Phelps has taken over the Phelps empire and she's the one who travels everywhere. She organizes everything. She speaks to the media. And luckily she's not on the road right now doing a protest. She just called me back and we're going to meet with her at 2.15. Oh, cool. Hair. Yeah, that's good. Can I see both of us all right? Yep, I think good? so. Yep, looks pretty. good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Let me all right. Talk. So let's talk. All right. Um, okay, so can you just start by introducing yourself and telling me what you do? Yes, I, I'm Shirley Phelps Roper. First, I'm the servant of the living God. I'm a mother of 11, grandmother, wife. I'm a lawyer. And... Um, what I do with my days is uh, hit the ground running early, do all things publishing the Word of God before the whole world, and enable all my loved ones who would do that also. With everything I have, all my resources is towards that end. Because the Lord is coming, but before that, this nation's doom is imminent. Imminent. In fact, I hope you can get your stuff done before that happens. <laughs> I'm just saying. Urgent. Think urgent. America's doomed. Can you tell me how you guys got started? We have a park that's about a half a mile from here where people were having sex in the public park and the city fathers wouldn't do anything about it. That's the short of it. Mm -hmm. Nobody ought to be having sex in a public park where children go to play and families go to, to have recreational activity. And so, um, that's how it started and then uh, one thing led to another and the response that we received was so over the top and wrong that we kind of added to our sign stuff like watch your kids gays troll this park mm. and this park is unsafe for children and gays in the bushes stuff like that yeah. and then how, how did god hates fags come yes from? well interestingly unbeknownst to us, mm -hmm. there was already a well-oiled machine called the, let's call it the gay rights movement. Mm -hmm. Let's call it the homosexual juggernaut. 
was tearing through this land. They had strategies and we didn't even know it. We quickly learned it though, because first thing we knew, right out of left field it seemed to us, here comes a bunch of um, students from KU. They had signs that said stuff like, true churches preach love. If they thought they were gonna scare us off, like, yikes, you picked the wrong people. Mm -hmm. They just didn't know what they had stepped off into because the Lord our God had prepared us for this day. The Bible speaks to this question mm -hmm. that they keep goading us about, which is the love of God, which cannot be discussed without the hatred of God. Mm -hmm. He says, to understand my love, you have got to understand my hatred. Uh, what was it specifically about the high school that you went to protest? They have a GSA club, mm -hmm. a gay straight alliance. I know high school students. Yeah. They don't have to be that. Mm -hmm. I don't have any of those kind of that mm -hmm. that, I, that have ever lived around me whatsoever. Um, okay, I have to take that back. I did have a brother that was a, a rebel. That was gay? No, no, he was just a rebel. Oh, okay. Look, you don't have to just be gay. No. That's just the bottom rung on the depravity chain. Okay. And they're not gay, by the way. They're not gay. Oh, you mean gay, gay actually happy? means exactly. Okay, right. They are not gay people. Um, they have a shorter lifespan. Mm -hmm. They have sorrow and misery, disease, STDs. There's nothing on the landscape for them. And by the way, somewhere along the way, they might get grossed out. Mm -hmm. I mean, that whole eating feces and uh, all that yuck. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the way, somebody might be thinking, this is not the best way to live. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they better have a lot of soap and no bar soap, all liquid, <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of hand wipes. You got to be cleaning all the doorknobs. <laughs> so the, the word that you guys use is fag. And wh yeah. where does that come from? Well, it came from ancient Sodom. Okay. And it's an, it's an elegant, perfect metaphor. Mm -hmm. The faggot was a is a bundle of sticks mm -hmm. and its characteristics is that it burns quick and hot mm. and it fuels the fires of nature. So how perfect, mm -hmm. how perfect that it would be because these perverts fuel the fires of God's wrath and they fuel the fires of hell. Gay is a word that this modern uh, so-called gay rights movement mm -hmm. coined to try to um, fool, stupid, asleep at the wheel, doomed Americans into thinking, oh, these people are just so misunderstood, they're just good-hearted, blah, blah, blah. Barf is that that. I want to talk to you about um, the Laramie Project yes. and why it is that you do protests at um, productions of the Laramie Project. It creates such an, a, an excellent backdrop for this message. There's only one important thing about Matthew Shepard today. He's in hell. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not do all these things that include sodomy, adultery, incest, and bestiality. Those are mainstays in doomed America. The land vomiting out this nation, this generation, this filthy nation of rebels against God, and they've got no cause. So the land is gonna vomit them out, and I can hardly wait. That October was the murder of Matthew Shepard, and it happened on a campus uh, called, um, I'm sorry, it happened obviously in Wyoming, but they took Matthew to the nearest major medical hospital, which was in Fort Collins. I remember one of our board members called me and told me what had happened. And I knew then that the, uh, the stigma caused by a hate crime was going to hit us hard, and it did. Attendance at our activities dropped in half because of fear. And it took years for that to build back up. A fraternity and sorority on the campus in Fort Collins, which is Colorado State University, um, they took a scarecrow because it was part of their float. If you remember, Matthew was described as looking like a scarecrow. And so they had taken the scarecrow and wrote the word fag, and they put it on, on their homecoming float. And I believe it said gay on the front of the scarecrow, and it said something like fag on the back of the scarecrow. And so this fraternity had done this as part of their homecoming parade, which was like the Wizard of Oz was a theme. So it's not like they went out of the way to create the scarecrow, but the fact that they felt it was okay 
uh, to per perpetuate that type of hatred. Um, and so I was brought in about a month later because my book had just come out about gay men and fraternities to do a presentation. And so since then I've been on nearly 750 colleges and university campuses. Um, I go back every two to three years depending on what the campus needs. For a long time we would hear from people in neighboring states, no I'm not coming to Wyoming. That's where Matthew Shepard died. But, but that's gone now. I really don't think people are feeling that fear anymore. It's, and I think people are a lot more optimistic and I think, I think the GLBT community here in Wyoming is, is really looking forward to the future. It's going to be a bright one for us. You know, we're finding common ground um, and I think that there is common ground and I think as long as we're both willing to accept that we're going to move forward. Especially in Salt Lake, we, there's a really large population of GLBT people here. They move from, you know, Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, all over Utah, even northern Nevada. Um, and it's become like this little gay mecca here in this really red, one of the reddest states in the union is all of a sudden the home to tons of GLBT people. We've created a subculture where acceptance is in, where love is in, where being GLBT is in, and it's, and it's not only just tolerated, it's accepted. And um, we know what restaurants to shop at, we know what realtors to use, we know um, we've become very savvy. And so we have um, become um, powerful. You know, the, we've got a big buying power here um, and, and nationally. And, um, and so yeah, we, we're, we're learning our own power and we're kind of harnessing it. And so I feel like we've made a lot of progress. and. The progress has been that we've like realized just how strong we are, and so I can't even wait to see what we will do in the future. I was expecting to hear a lot more horror stories, and I did. I heard we heard a, definitely a good a good chunk of horror stories, but the optimism that these people have, you know, like we lost this, we lost that, but we're not giving up hope. We're still meeting. We're you know we're gonna do this. All right, I'm going to CNN.com because right now the California Supreme Court decision on same-sex marriage is about to be announced. California Supreme Court upholds ban on new same-sex marriages, but lets us as America stand. We lost. What do we want? Equality! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Equality! When do we want it? Now! I'm still pretty shocked. We, we lost in California. We just lost there. We're not gonna... We just are not going to have... Um, equal marriage rights there. So that's pretty intense, actually. I've been working to organize a protest in New Orleans in case Proposition 8 was upheld by the court. And since we just got the news that it has been upheld, I'm gonna make some calls to some people that I've been speaking to in New Orleans and see if we can get um, some people together and get a protest down there. We wanna have protests all over the country today. You know, California, Boston, New York, Florida, New Orleans, Kansas. Mississippi, Michigan, everywhere. We gotta be on the streets today. Well, I think it's incredibly inspiring to see so many people come out after Prop 8. Sometimes it takes something like that to inspire people. I think people realize that this really is about all our rights. Uh, it it seemed, seemed about more than about marriage. All right, who wants to start? I'm Melvin. Yeah. Want to start? Today sucked. Yeah. It is a sad day when the court, charged with protecting the minority from the tyranny of the majority, uphold a system where fundamental rights are decided by popular vote. If the terrible precedent is set that a group of ill-informed people, whether they are the majority or the minority, are able to take away the rights of any minority, then what does the future hold? It's about winning hearts and minds everywhere. I am a straight person who is fully supportive of equality for everyone. All right! We've now experienced twice what no one should ever experience, um, having your right to marry put up for a vote, first by the voters in Prop 8 and then by the justices um, in the case about Prop 8. And that was a very painful election night. Um, many, many people were celebrating the presidential election, but our hearts were sinking as we saw the numbers come in about Prop 8. In our society, marriage is not simply a religious institution. The government's accounting office lists 1,138 legal rights that are conferred upon heterosexual married couples. 
by not being allowed to get married, lesbians and gays are denied not just the legal and economic benefits, but all the emotional and social benefits as well. Often when we spoke um, against Prop 8, uh, we showed the picture of Stuart's mom and dad and said, just imagine 60 years ago if their marriage, which was possible only because of the court decision in California. What if that had been put up for a popular vote? I can guarantee you what the result would be. In 1958, the first Gallup poll on the issue showed, I believe, over 95% uh, opposed to couples like Stuart's and mom and dad from being able to, to marry. Our rights are human rights, and there is no different between the fight for marriage equality and the fight against either the Jim Crow laws or the anti-miscegenation laws, which existed in this state and in many states throughout the country. On June 17th, this building was filled with hundreds of couples and their wedding parties exchanging vows. Every nook and cranny of San Francisco City Hall was filled with wedding parties, gay and straight. Um, because it was just two human beings uh, exchanging vows. Um, but I can't tell you what a joyous place San Francisco was, but in particular this, this spot, it seemed truly like the happiest place on earth. Folks, what happened in California is a setback, but we will not be second-class citizens. We're never going back there. This is our time, Woo! our struggle, and we are gonna win! never believe that Louisiana is a lost cause. If marriage equality can happen anywhere, it can happen here. If it can happen in Iowa, it can happen here. Um, I have a question for you guys. What is it that we want? Equality! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Equality! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Equality! When do we want it? Now! I find it more inspiring when people do what's not expected of them when they turn the tide and that someone could just push for um, the opposite of what they were brought up with just because it's right. And that to me is true activism when you choose to say something or choose to do something not because of what's expected of you, you do it because it's right. I'm Greg Lemke. I'm a lieutenant with the Fargo Police Department. I've been with the department for be 23 years next month. I also serve as a GLBT liaison for the police department, and that's a position that we've had for, up, I think, three years now, three years in March, that the, the position was created. It was created, um, I just requested that, that our chief at the time, Chief Magnus, um, that we have a GLBT liaison. And currently, uh, from my understanding, and I didn't look recently, but it was last year anyway, there's only about a dozen uh, departments in the United States that have liaison. When I first came out um, 10 years ago, 15, I lose track of time, um, it was, it was a very difficult, it was very different. It was a, a difficult situation. I had supervisors that I had I heard making jokes prior about you know being gay and stuff like that officers saying they wouldn't help me if I needed help. But the environment is, is vastly improved around here. And, and for me, it's not that difficult. There has been a history, and, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but we'll also talk about the history between law enforcement and our government and the uh, GLBT community. And it hasn't been very good. They won't um, um, deal with law enforcement and, and cooperate with law enforcement for fear of being outed. And part of that reason is, again, if you look at people in North Dakota, uh, for instance, me working in Fargo, if the chief wanted to, he could fire me without having a reason. You're, you're going to come in contact with GLBT people, sometimes at work, sometimes in the public, and you won't know, and it won't matter. It's not part of the issue. Whatever your personal beliefs are, that's up to you and for you to, to you know, deal with and, and share those with your family or friends or religious group, whatever. But stay away from that when you're in law enforcement and dealing with the public. I'm at the point where, and when I've spoken at our pride rallies and stuff is, we need to quit asking for a seat at the table, for, uh, so to speak. We need to just push a chair up there and say, we're, we're here, we're gonna sit down and we're, we want equality. Get involved, stay involved, uh, pressure our elected people. It's not gonna happen for us, 
you know, and, and up to now it's happened to us. I mean, they've, we've been treated badly and not, don't get uh, equal rights and, and fairness. We have to make it happen. We need to use the urgency of the moment to just keep pushing through and, and figure out how do we speed up the pace of change? Because the, every moment we're waiting is someone that isn't getting to live their life to the fullest. It's, it's these baby steps that we take, whether it's a local ordinance, whether it's getting the Kentucky Human Rights Commission you know, on, on our side. Um, it's these little incremental steps that, that realistically we can get there and then we can celebrate these victories and you know, that's the impetus to keep people moving. Every step that we take towards, um, towards educating voters and elected officials about who we really are and what it is we really want. It's not so much about saying you're wrong, you're, you're homophobic, you're a bigot, you're you know, this, you're that. It's about sitting down with somebody who may start out really believing that, um, really having different beliefs than I do. But the more we talk and the more we build relationship and when they meet my family and when they meet my friends' families and when I stay in communication with them and I go to their Christmas parties and I send them a birthday card and um, it, it, um, the reality of our lives becomes something that they can connect with and something they can understand. We're worried about the same things everybody else is. Can we pay the rent? Am I going to get laid off? You know, what do you mean you left your new shoes down at the lake? You know, and it's Monday and the lake's two hours away. You know, it's the same things everybody else is dealing with. You know, trying to have best quality of life, trying to take care of our families and protect them, trying to make sure our children get an adequate education, making, you know, I'm dealing with, oh my God, she's going to college. Our lives aren't just about you know, the laws that are passed, and they're not just about what we see on television. But you think of all the different ways that you are that you show up in the world you know at work at home at wherever you're worshiping or not worshiping those are the kind of things that until you can be completely honest in every one of those settings we're not entirely free in working with transcend uh, I hear the stories you know I get the phone calls at three o'clock in the morning from the person that got fired um, and is considering suicide you know, because their life is just, you know, all they want to do is, is live with some peace of mind about who they are, but their life gets shredded because of, they don't have any protections. You have to personalize the issue, and um, by personalize I mean you have to tell people your story. My parents um, are Southern Baptist missionaries. So it didn't go over well um, when I talked to my dad for the first time, just I didn't even know what the word gay was. I was just kind of confused. And that was the first night that I was, ended up in the emergency room um, from my dad. It happened seven more times. I went through the whole conversion therapy. They told me that every single gay person was killed off at birth and that I was the last one left so that I needed to get fixed or else, you know, the government would find me. Um, we did the whole gambit. I've done the electroshock. I've done, if, if it's in, immoral and inhumane, I've probably had it done to me to get me back. I terribly wanted to change because I was really done. My mom found me um, on my second attempt at suicide, told me that it would all end. All I had to do was just say that I was fixed. Pretty much to save my life, I said I was fixed. Um, but at that point, I was in, we were in Iowa. I still honestly believed I was the last one on earth. I truly, I had never seen a gay, I mean, we watched PBS, if we could ever watch any TV. I, I really thought I was alone, and so that meant that I was never going to get to, you know, love anyone. But that's okay, you know, I'll just live a life alone. I got to college in Kansas, and I met the very first, my, uh, my lesbian mothers, as I like to call them. I nearly screamed when I met her. I couldn't believe that there was another person. Uh, I was photographing the ballet Trocadero from the wings of the stage in San Jose and uh, it was very exciting partly because Harvey and Scott were such huge ballet fans that I was was just so thrilled that I was going to be able to sort of have bragging rights with them you know and and Scott and I had met Zami Zamora at the camera store he stopped in to develop his film and he said oh I'm a principal dancer at the ballet Trocadero 
and our friend Dennis Lusk was there and he was like, oh, can I come take pictures? And I, I was like a little taken aback because I was like, God, that's so brazen, you know? And Sammy was like, oh, sure, of course. And so then I was like, well, can I come too? And he's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. So he let me shoot from the wings. And uh, somewhere in between there, I developed a romance with him too. So um, it was, that was going on as well. Um, so I, I go to San Jose and I'm hanging out with Sammy and I'm, I did these amazing pictures. And we were coming back to the city on Monday morning, the 27th, and we're getting off the bus from San Jose and our bus driver disembarks and there's another bus driver standing there and that bus driver says, did you hear to our bus driver, did you hear that Moscone and Milk were killed? And just as he says that, we were getting off the bus. So we heard him say that and I thought, my God, what did I just hear? And then he says, oh, and that Harvey Milk, he's no loss. And I'm like, my God, what did I just hear? That, that can't be true. And then we got in a taxi, and sure enough, over the, the radio, was verified. So we drove to my house in the hate, and uh, I was devastated, you know. And Zammy was there to comfort me, and then like within an hour, two other boyfriends were there to comfort me. So I was like surrounded by three very close friends and uh, finally calmed down and I went out to the newspaper stand, well I went out to take a walk and there on the newspaper stand was the daily paper with my picture of Harvey announcing that he had been assassinated. So that was weird, yeah. kind of sent me back into a tailspin. My sister and her family were with us for a holiday and all the kids are sleeping in, in one room. And I hear my nephew and my, and my son, they were almost the same age, up talking away all night long. And I go in there, I said, guys, you really gotta get to sleep, you know? And so my nephew says to me, and he's only known Jim and I, we've been together you know, 24 years. So uh, he's only known the two of us together. And he said, Uncle Warren, how come Christopher has two dads? And I said, oh, you know, we know lots of different families. You know, we know families with two dads, two moms, one mom, one dad. We know families where the kids are being raised by a, their mom and their grandma, you know? And I said, yeah, and we know those ordinary families that just have a mom and a dad. Like, it's just a different kind of family. He's like, oh, okay. He gets it, you know, he grows up with it. Um, and so I think that you know, so much of our, our messaging, you know, is, it's really, it's finding the, the place to do it and not shirking from it. You know, like if, you know, the, the mother who says, I can't talk about what gay means to a kid. Well, you can, you know? You, you, Answer the questions they're asking, not, I mean, a kid who's asking what does gay mean is not looking for a biology lesson, you know, or, you know, some kind of description of, you know, intimacy between people. You know, what do you say when she says, what does it mean that, you know, you and dad, how come you and daddy sleep in the same bed? Why would, you know, what would your response be to her then? Can't, you know, you don't say, ah, oh, well, because you go through a whole detailed experience of your life in the bedroom. You know, you say, because we love each other. Or something like that. Damn it, gay or not, I should be able to have a happy life wherever I live. And it's, I shouldn't have to feel that I need to move to a bigger city so that I am accepted. This battle is being won in one on one conversations, in one on one dialogue with mom, one on one dialogue with perhaps a closeted father one-on-one -on -one dialogue with Joe next door, one-on-one -on -one dialogue with Mrs. Simmons across the street. Letting people know who we are, letting the eyes that are the windows of the soul shine forth with, with the love that's within us all and we know the truth. God loves everybody he ever made in the whole world. Why do we get so complicated with big churches of fighting each other? Yeah, right. There's something in here, and I'm the simplest little person you've ever seen, uh -huh. but I'm gonna tell them, don't get complicated with love. It is important for me to go ahead and affirm that uh, I think same-sex couples should be able to get married. It has been a long time of coming. Let's just wait for you to see.
say all the more sweet. Tonight, because of the work of everyone in this room and so many staff and volunteers and supporters all over the country, we have finally won. <laughs> We've all been on this journey for a long time. And today, the highest court in this land said we are equal. We are equal. We know we are equal. We know we deserve equality. And we will keep fighting until we get it in every state in this country. Better. 